Welcome to Archaeoed, a podcast about the civilizations of the ancient Americas. You know, the ones that American history books never talk about. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnhart. I've been an archaeologist, an explorer, and a seeker of esoteric knowledge all over the planet for over 30 years now. In this podcast, I'll share what I've learned. Sometimes it'll be stories of my adventures. Other times, it'll be things I've learned along the way. It'll be whatever I feel like talking about because this is my podcast, Beholden to No One. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Season 5, Episode 5, The Milky Way, Path to the Other World. I've been thinking about the Milky Way and what it meant to the people of the ancient Americas for over 30 years now. I'm going to put my very first paper on the subject, from 1994, in my show notes. It's not really very well written, so please be kind if you do read it. I'm really just sharing it to show you that I've been thinking about this for a very long time. My hypothesis is that there's a surprising continuity over time and space in regards to what the Milky Way represented to the peoples of the ancient Americas. Every ancient American culture saw the Milky Way as the path to the other world. And in all my years, I've only found things that have reinforced that belief in me that this is a solid hypothesis. From Chile to Alaska, the Milky Way was, and in places still is, seen as the path between worlds. Each version of its story involves local flora, fauna, and geography. Key Milky Way orientations, change from place to place, And the stated reasons for traveling the road can change too. But underneath it all is a powerful continuity. The Milky Way is a two-way road between the earthly realm and the other world. The souls of the dead travel it. Shamans in trance travel it. Sleeping people who dream are on it. Conversely, supernatural spirits and sometimes deities can travel it from their world to the world of men. In this episode, I'm going to go through a list of supporting evidence, starting in South America, moving to Mesoamerica in Part 2, and finally to North America in Part 3. Then I'll conclude with my thoughts on how this continuity happened. But first, let's talk a bit about the Milky Way itself. Without light pollution, the Milky Way is the biggest, most beautiful feature in the night sky. It's a shame that most of us never get to see it anymore. It's just not very bright, so even minor light pollution hides it from the human eye. Before electricity, everyone saw it, and they saw it every night of the year, of course, unless it was cloudy. We people of the modern world know what the Milky Way is. It's the galaxy that our solar system is in. We're on an outer arm of a spiral galaxy and we're looking at a cross-section from within it. The Milky Way galaxy, like all galaxies, is much, much thinner than it is wide. It's like a tortilla, if that tortilla was normal thickness but hundreds of miles in diameter. The band in the sky that we call the Milky Way moves with the stars. It's part of them. During March through September, we see the part with the big bulge in the center. That's the galactic center. In the other months, we're looking at outer arms during the night. But since we're inside of it, we see some section of it all year long. The objects that we can see within our own solar system, being the sun, the moon, and five visible planets, they move very differently. The stars, including the Milky Way, are the backdrop, and the objects in our solar system are like the dancers on its stage. And while they moved funny, attracting the notice of ancient astronomers, the Milky Way was consistently the dominant feature in the night sky. Not surprisingly, the entire ancient world had ideas about the Milky Way. The term Milky Way comes from the Roman Via Lactea, 
and they got it from the Greeks, who called it Galaxis Kyklos. That means the Milky Circle. Both of those civilizations explained it as a spray of milk that came from Hera's breast. Zeus attached a baby Hercules to her while she slept. When she woke up and slapped Zeus's bastard off of her breast, the Milky Way was formed. For the Babylonians, it was the tail of the dragon Tiamat that was chopped off by a god named Marduk. The ancient Chinese and Hindu civilizations both called it the river in the sky. The Hindus thought it was a mirror image of their sacred river, the Ganges. References like this are from all over the old world, and they're easy to come by. But reliable info about the new world is much harder to find. But that's what I'm here for. So, let's talk about the Milky Way in the ancient Americas. We'll start in South America. The information we have is hit and miss. It can come from contact period ethnologies. It can come from ancient art and hieroglyphs. In limited cases, it can come from building orientations. But if we don't have any of that for a given civilization, well, we don't have a leg to stand on. Fortunately, when it comes to the Inca, we have a lot of information. The Inca creation story tells us that their creator deity Viracocha called forth the sun, the moon, and the stars from the island of the sun in Lake Titicaca. Then he flew away following the path of the Wilcomayo River northwest and up into the sky. The Wilcomayo is a major Andean river, and its name translates sacred river, and the Milky Way in its same northwest orientation, is a mirror of that river in the sky. The souls of the dead follow that path to the other world, and spirits descend to the earth along the same path. Renowned Incan scholar Gary Erton did his dissertation fieldwork in the little Quechua village of Mizmane in the Sacred Valley just north of the ancient Inca capital, which is Cusco. The farmers of that village explained how the sky is divided into four quadrants by an axis formed by the Milky Way. At the solstice, at twilight, the Milky Way's midsection passes through the zenith of the sky. The two times it does that create the axis and divide the sky. The people of Mizmane laid out their village to mirror that. It has two roads crossing in the middle, dividing their community into four quadrants. Further, they note that the Milky Way axis going north, so northwest southeast is the same angle as the Wilcomayo River. That mirroring of terrestrial and celestial space was the inspiration for Erton's book on the subject. He called it At the Crossroads of the Earth and Sky. Really a great book. I highly recommend it. But it makes me wonder further, were the four quadrants of the Inca Empire created under the same guidelines? The divisions roughly follow the axial orientation of the roads at Mizmene. And just a reminder, the Inca name for their empire was Tiwantinsuyu, the land of four quarters. No, I'm not sure whether that four quarters that we see in Mizname is a good match for the four quarters of the Inca Empire, like a microcosm and macrocosm. I'm just saying that there seems to be similarities and that the Milky Way just might have influenced how those four corners of the Inca Empire were defined. Now, one more thing I want to say about the Inca and the Milky Way. It's not really part of my hypothesis. It's just cool. For reasons of atmospherical variations, the Milky Way is brighter in the Southern Hemisphere than it is in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's perhaps in part because of that that the Inca saw constellations within the Milky Way's dark parts. Erton called them dark star constellations. They're fun and easy to see once you know what their names are. 
They're things like the llama, the fox, the toad, the snake, the coal sack. And once you figure out which ones we're talking about, you really do see those shapes there. It's kind of like the shapes we see in clouds. With just a little imagination, you recognize them. Besides an emu in the Milky Way seen by the Australian Aboriginal culture, I know of no other culture that had these dark star constellations. I think it gives the Inca kind of a special relationship with the Milky Way, and I think it's neat. Moving to the Amazon, there are dozens of traditional tribes still living within its dense jungles. Only a few have been extensively studied and fewer still have been asked any questions regarding astronomy. But the book Amazonian Cosmos by Reichel Dolmakov does provide that kind of information, and it turns out the Milky Way is a standout. The tribe Reichel Dolmakov studied is the Tucano, who live in the Amazon of Colombia. The Tucano have a creator deity named Viho Mase, when asked where he resides, they say the Milky Way. Spirits called Viho Masa also reside there, and Tucano shamans in trance can visit them there. The word Viho is very telling. It's also the Tucano word for ayahuasca, the powerful hallucinogenic vine of the Amazon. That's the one these shamans use to get in that trance and to go to the Milky Way. Viho is the vehicle to enter the spirit world, a.k.a. the Milky Way. The title for the top shaman in a Tucano community is Gumu. But Gumu is also the term for the main supporting beam of a Tucano longhouse. The Gumu beam goes east-west, longwise across the lodge, supported by three sections of posts. Those three sections of posts symbolize the three-tiered universe, and the Gumu is the Milky Way that connects them all. So, if the top shaman is a Gumu, he's symbolically the Milky Way, the path between worlds. This Tucano ethnography didn't talk directly about the souls of the dead, and the orientation of the Milky Way is east-west, but still, its identity as the path is very clear. So, okay, there's a bit about the Milky Way in ancient South America. I'll take my first commercial break right here, and when I return, we'll move to ancient Mesoamerica. Hey, folks, it's still me, Ed. One of these days, I'll attract some commercial revenue. But until then, I'll just keep plugging my own stuff. I love the ancient Maya calendar. I love to learn about it and I love to teach about it. As part of my teaching mission, I create an annual wall calendar that correlates the Maya calendar with the Christian Gregorian calendar. It functions just like a normal wall calendar with 12 months and all the Western holidays displayed. But it also tells you what day it is in the ancient Maya calendar, the Sulkin, the Hob, and the long count cycles. The photos for each month are beautiful windows into the ruins of the Maya world, taken by the 12 winners of our annual photo contest. The 2024 Mayan calendar is available for purchase now at my website, mayan-calendar.com. That website also contains a lot of interesting information about ancient Maya calendrical cycles. So even if you don't want a wall calendar, you'll probably like the website. Again, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an N, dash symbol, calendar.com. All the civilizations of ancient Mesoamerica believed in a three-tiered universe, an upper world, the world of men, and an underworld. But it's not like a subway line with three stops. It's more like a loop connecting all three. The upper and lower worlds are together the other world. The dead, dreaming people, and shamans in trance can enter that other world. The Milky Way is the path. But in Mesoamerican art, they tend to focus on the entrance to that path. 
Literature often calls that the portal. Visually, the portal is portrayed as a cave or the mouth of a snake or sometimes the mouth of a mountain deity. And rather than showing people entering that portal, religious art tends to show them returning from the other world, exiting the portal. As early as the Olmecs, 3,000 years ago, we see images of people emerging from caves. The Zapotecs and Mixtecs also favored showing the portal as a cave entrance. Culture heroes and priests emerging from caves or holes in the ground are all over the Mixtec codices. The Toltec and Aztecs wore headdresses that had snake heads on top with chin straps that were the snake's lower jaw. The symbolism there is that the warriors are emerging from the mouth of the snake, a.k.a. the portal to the other world. It was meant to say, I'm coming straight out of the supernatural world at my enemies. The Maya also depict the portal as the mouth of a snake. The temple of the warriors at Chichen Itza is full of snakes with human heads emerging from their open mouths. But perhaps the most beautiful depiction in the Maya world of this concept is Yashilan Lintel 25. On that lintel, Queen Cabal Shock kneels in front of a bowl where her blood is being burned. As the smoke rises from the bowl, it becomes a snake. Its open mouth burps out a figure above the queen's head. It's her ancestor, lineage founder Yat Balam, emerging and coming to her from the other world. The blood becomes the smoke, becomes the snake. The ritual is opening the portal. Maya hieroglyphs identify that snake as Boots Chan, the smoke serpent. He's the conduit between this world and the other. Mesoamerica's love of artistic variation on a theme can make their messages and symbols really confusing. For example, the Maya like to use the snake mouth when depicting the portal. The Aztecs preferred to use a smoking mirror. Both meant the portal, but an outsider wouldn't necessarily know that. Especially within the massive corpus of Maya art, the multiple meanings or aspects of symbols can be simply dizzying. When it comes to the Milky Way, no single book explains it better than Maya Cosmos by David Friedel, Linda Sheely, and Joy Parker. Being a former student of Sheely, I tend to unfairly consider it her book, but Friedel was really an equal partner in its paradigm-shifting theories. Joy Parker was their editor, but her contributions improved the book's readability so much that they made her a full third author. Sheely was the hieroglyphic expert. Epigraphy is the technical term for that line of study. Friedel was an archaeologist with a ton of ethnographic research under his belt. At the time, being the early 1990s, Sheely was especially focused on understanding the texts explaining Maya creation stories. The texts she was translating off of classic period stela were clearly mirroring the story of the Popol Vuh, but the ancient texts provided additional information and characters. Much of it had her baffled, especially the locations mentioned. There was the Wakachan, which meant the raised up sky. Then there was the Uti Chachan, the lying down sky. And then there was the Yash Osh Tunal, the first three stones place. She could read the names, but she really wasn't sure what it meant. She knew with all the sky references that it must have something to do with astronomy, but what? To try to understand, she did what too many Western scholars fail to do. She asked the modern Maya. That's where her friend and colleague David Friedel came in. He knew Maya people all over the place. You know how I love a long story, but I'm going to cut to the chase here. They theorized, with abundant supporting evidence from both modern Maya and hieroglyphs, that the Maya story of creation is played out in the turning of the night sky, and the Milky Way happens to have the lead role. There are two days associated with creation in Maya hieroglyphics, February 5th and August 13th. 
The night sky on those days, through a few constellations and the Milky Way, appear to tell the story. August 13th begins with the Milky Way oriented north-south and going right through the zenith of the sky. In that orientation, it's the world tree, and its name is the Wakachan, the raised-up sky. As the night continues, the Milky Way tilts and the Big Dipper is just to the east. That's the constellation of Seven Macaw, the false son of the third creation. The Hero Twins shot him out of the World Tree, and the Big Dipper is him falling out of the tree. Then as the night progresses, the Milky Way tilts into an east-west direction, or orientation, and that's the Uti Cha Chan, the laid-down sky. Finally, just before dawn, it tilts up and becomes the canoe that the paddler gods use to take the maze god up into the sky. And then just as the sun rises on August 13th, the constellation Orion is at the zenith of the sky. To the modern Maya, Orion is a constellation called the Three Hearthstones. That's the first three stone place from the classic period texts. It also is mentioned in the Popol Vuh. The last act of the Hero Twins is to set the three stones in the center of the sky and start the stars spinning. Now, admittedly, that's a confusing amount of things that the Milky Way can be. And honestly, I struggle to grasp it myself. The concept of cyclical transformation is foreign to Western thinking, but it was central to the ancient Maya worldview. Regardless, this discovery led to some important new understandings about Maya art in general. The Milky Way in its north-south orientation, now identified as the Wakachan, the stood-up sky, is the world tree. August 13th's night sky begins with the Wakachan, and February 5th's night sky ends with it. When it's in that north-south position, the ecliptic path of the sun crosses it running east-west. It was already known that Mesoamerica symbolizes the ecliptic as a double-headed snake. It gobbles up the sun in the east at dawn and spits it out in the west at dusk. Just to let you know how prevalent the symbol is and how important it is, there's actually a double-headed serpent that's the outer border of the famous Aztec calendar stone. There's also one on the famous tomb lid of Pakal's sarcophagus in Palenque. Before the discoveries published in Maya Cosmos, it was just a double-headed snake hanging off a tree. But with the Wakachan world tree now identified as the Milky Way, that snake could now be interpreted as the ecliptic. And if the tree on Pakal's tomb lid is the Milky Way, and Pakal's dead body is falling down it into the skeletal jaws of the underworld, that means that Pakal's soul traveled the Milky Way into the land of the dead. The associated hieroglyphs support that interpretation even further. When discussing Pakal's death, they read, He entered the road. What road, you ask? Well, it seems pretty clear. It's the Milky Way, the path to the other world. These new understandings also helped us interpret a strange bar that Maya kings are often depicted holding in front of them. The bar is held horizontally in front of the king's chest and has a snake head on either side. We call it the double-headed serpent bar. If it's the ecliptic, that means that the king is in the position of the Wakachan, the world tree, the Milky Way. As such, the king is the bridge between the worlds, and that's exactly what they do in their bloodletting rituals, just like Queen Cabal Shock of Yashilan did when the smoke serpent burped out her great-great-grandfather. And just in case any of this is starting to make sense, the word Chan means sky, but it also can mean snake. Transforming Symbols now we link the Bootschan smoke serpent with the Wakachan raised up sky with the world tree and finally to the Milky Way. 
I've probably done a pretty crappy job trying to explain all of this. If you want a better one, I highly recommend Maya Cosmos. I'll put an Amazon link in my show notes. But the takeaway here is this. We are quite certain that the ancient Maya saw the Milky Way in its north-south orientation as the path to the other world. I'll take my final commercial break here, and when I return, we'll move to North America. After years of hard work, software engineer Matt Neal and I have created the most sophisticated Maya calendar date conversion calculator ever made. We call it Bars and Dots, and we're giving it away for free. Bars and Dots is the name handed down to us from the man who made the world's first Maya calendar software, Sid Hollander. Sid left us in May of 2022, but his memory lives on through Bars and Dots. This resource is not for the casual learner. If you're new to the Maya calendar, it's guaranteed to make your eyes cross. But for those who really want to know the depths of its sophistication and intricacies, Bars and Dots is for you. Check it out and play with it at barsanddots.com. That's bars, A-N-D, dots, dot com. If you're a math nerd like me, it'll blow your mind. I'm back after what no doubt was a very compelling commercial. Okay then, on to North America. Nowhere is the Milky Way's connection to the path stronger than in ancient North America. My old paper discussed over a dozen tribes who all said that. Since then, I've read about at least a dozen more. As always, What we know is a product of available ethnologies and what questions their ethnographers decided to ask. If they didn't ask about the Milky Way, then we don't have that information. But luckily, in the case of North America, Milky Way references often came out when ethnographers asked about mortuary practices. The area where I'm still really searching for evidence from is the American Southwest. I can't really find anything for the ancestral Pueblo regarding the Milky Way, which is extra strange considering that the Pueblo people still exist and retain many of their traditions. And as hard as I try, I know I'll never be in command of the entire corpus of anthropological literature. So if any of you listeners have anything to contribute on this subject, be it ancestral Pueblo or anything else, please email me. I am an unrepentant, lifelong learner. What little I do know about the Four Corners area is this. The Navajo and Apache both say that dead souls travel the Milky Way for four days before reaching the other side. The Pawnee are an almost opposite case. We know a ton about how they viewed the Milky Way, in large part because of the work of a man named James Murray. James Murray was born in 1862 as a Pawnee living in Nebraska before the tribe was forcibly moved to Oklahoma. James Murray was not his birth name. He got that in one of those terrible Indian acculturation schools. He survived that school, and with a promise to spread the word of the Bible, he was allowed to return to his birth community. His command of English introduced him to a few anthropologists who came through Nebraska, and they inspired him to write his own ethnography on the Pawnee. The result was a two-volume compilation of everything Pawnee that he could glean from the tribal elders. And probably because he was a Pawnee himself, they told him things that they would have never discussed with an outsider. Murray's book tells us about the night sky and its many constellations. On the Milky Way, he was quite clear that it was the path that souls took to the other world. Further, he said that they entered the road in the north, facing challenges along the way, and ultimately entered the other world at a portal on the south end. One of the Pawnee constellations next to the Milky Way is two men carrying a third on a stretcher. 
That north-south orientation of the Milky Way is repeated in many of the tribes who are the descendants of the Mississippian civilization. Various Sioux tribes see it as a north-south path called the Ghost Road. They add further that an old woman waits at the south end to judge souls and make sure they're worthy of entering the afterlife. James Mooney, who studied the Paiute ghost dances in the 1890s, said that the associated songs typically mentioned the Milky Way. Again, another link here. Up in the northeast of the modern U.S., the Iroquois spoke of the Great Sky Road that extended from the south for the dead to walk. Going to the opposite shore and the Quaquitl people of British Columbia, Canada, they also see the Milky Way as a path to the other world. The Quaquitl see it as a river, not a road. But considering that they're a seafaring culture who followed the rivers up to fish for salmon in the season, that makes sense. They built a special winter lodge with a large central post that extends beyond the height of the roof. It's carved as a totem pole with specific characters along its length. The bottom is a monster who guards the north end of the Milky Way, the entrance. At the top is an eagle standing upon a grizzly bear. Quaquitl lore says that a bear guards the south entrance of the Milky Way, the portal to the afterlife. The eagle is specifically associated with Quaquitl shamans, yet another tie to that contacting the other world. I could go on with many other ethnographies, but my point is sufficiently supported here. I love how it's so consistent in ancient North America. The Milky Way, in its north-south orientation, is the path to the other world. Souls travel it, facing challenges along the way. Virtually everyone says that. But an acknowledged problem is that these accounts were collected centuries after first contact many of them a full 400 years after the first European swords and diseases decimated every ancient American civilization. Can we really assert that pre-Columbian peoples believed the same about the Milky Way? Well, I'm glad that I've pretended you asked that question. We're definitely making progress in that direction, especially with understanding iconography in ancient Mississippian art. Once again, it's the simple act of actually listening to the descendants of the Mississippians that's led to so many breakthroughs. Listening more carefully to things that were considered myths and legends, the Mississippian creation story is being pieced back together. And like the Inca and the Maya, Parts of their creation story involve celestial cycles and the Milky Way. One important piece of iconography is the Ogi, now identified as the portal to the other world. We see that all over their art. Another is the Thunderbirds, who live in the sky and protect humans from the Piasaws. They're winged snakes who come out at night and menace mankind, and the souls who are walking the path. There's also the old woman who never dies, who might be connected to the Sioux stories of the old woman who judges souls at the end of the road. One of my personal favorites is the symbol of an eye inside the open palm of a hand. Some scholars suggest it's from an old story of a giant ripping a hole in the Milky Way to spy on its enemies. But there's also another, more recent line of research that's been finding Milky Way alignments in the buildings of ancient Mississippian cities. The work is ongoing and spearheaded by my friend and colleague, Bill Romaine. Use William Romaine if you want to look up some of his publications. I'll put a few links to them in my show notes. Finding Milky Way alignments is tricky because it's part of the stars. The entire starscape shifts over time. We call that precession. Roughly, the stars shift one degree every 72 years. That means 720 years ago, the Milky Way was 10 degrees off where we see it today. Using astronomy software, Bill corrected for that, looking at the dates when Mississippian cities were still living communities. 
Then he used Google Earth to check the building alignments in those cities. We have good reason to believe that the Mississippians were honoring the solstices, especially summer solstice. Native American sun ceremonies typically happen at the summer solstice. There are some summer solstice building alignments in the Mississippian ruins, but not as many as we might expect. There are many more that are north-south or east-west alignments, but even those are often a few degrees off, confusing the pattern. What Bill Romaine has noticed is that at nightfall on the day of summer solstice, the Milky Way is lined up in a near-perfect north-south orientation. And of course, in that orientation, it's the path. Bill calls it the path of souls. But now here's the trick. The sky is a dome and nothing goes straight through it. Everything arcs through it, including the Milky Way. On the night of summer solstice, it arcs and it doesn't touch reciprocal points on the 360 degree circle of the compass. Its north end hits 23 degrees azimuth. That's 23 degrees east of straight north. The south end is more locked to south, sitting at 185 degrees azimuth. Bill has found two major Mississippian sites, Angel Mounds and Moundville, that have building alignments to 23 degrees azimuth. And at Cahokia, he found an alignment between Monk's Mound and Rattlesnake Mound that lines up to the south end of the Milky Way that azimuth of 185 degrees. A feature called the Rattlesnake Causeway connects those two buildings along that same 185 degree azimuth, making it very clear. Why two alignments to the north end of the Milky Way and another one to the south? Well, Bill's still scratching his head about that. But it's a theory in progress. I actually emailed Bill just before I wrote this podcast, asking him to clarify a few things. He replied, oh, aren't you Mr. Curious? But then he kindly answered my questions, and we discussed the further questions that his research brings up. For my part, I think Bill is right, and I'm thrilled by his discoveries. Honestly, I had kind of given up on my own Milky Way research, and Bill's discoveries inspire me to continue. As I want to do, I'm going to throw another half-baked theory your way, one inspired by Bill's alignment discoveries. One thing that has always confused me about the Mississippians are their burial patterns. There's a consistent occurrence in the burial mounds of a lot of people being interred all at once. In fact, the same exists in the mounds of the Hopewell and Adena cultures, centuries before the Mississippians. Why would that happen? Uh, I guess theories are maybe they were all a group that died in battle together? Maybe, but many are mixed groups of age and gender, so probably not. Also, we'd find wounds in their skeletal pathology if they had died in war, and they really don't show that either. How about mass sacrifice? We do, in fact, find that in Cahokia, groups of women whose skeletal pathology indicates that they were strangled. But actually, those Cahokia sacrifices are outliers. Most Mississippian burial groups are not sacrifices. Could it be disease? There are diseases that we can't detect in skeletons, but again, it's unlikely especially because that would mean that disease episodes struck again and again for hundreds of years. That's the only way that pattern would be produced, right? So, I'm thinking, what if it's about waiting for the Milky Way to line up north-south so it's the path of souls? Perhaps they partially prepared bodies at death, but then had to wait for the path to line up to finish the rituals and send them on their way? We know they had these very large charnel houses where they would prepare the dead. Some had the capacity for dozens of bodies at once. We find them burned and buried under the mounds. 
Could waiting for the path of souls, a.k.a. the Milky Way, to line up explain the pattern of group burial? I don't know, but it sounds logical to me. And Bill Romaine's alignment discoveries might just be supporting evidence. In any event, let me wrap this episode up by returning to my main hypothesis. All ancient American civilizations saw the Milky Way as the path to the other world. I hope I've convinced you of that by now. But then the question becomes, how or why? Did one culture spread it to the rest? It certainly doesn't seem so. There's no chronological sequence of first it appears there, then it appears there, next it appears over there. In fact, its antiquity is really poorly understood. We're not sure how old this tradition is. But here's what I think. I think it was a core belief brought by the very first people to cross from Asia into the Americas. I think it arrived perhaps tens of thousands of years ago with those first Americans, and it's been morphing into local variations ever since. In linguistics, we reconstruct dead languages and group languages into families by using core words they share in common. Words like mother, father, water, tree, etc. Those core words change very slowly over time and become the markers that prove linguistic common ancestry. I believe we can do the same thing for religious beliefs. Core concepts change the slowest. It works if you look at the commonalities between Hinduism and Buddhism, or the core similarities of Judeo-Christian faiths. So that's why I think the Milky Way is the path to the other world in all ancient civilizations. It's just a very ancient shared heritage. You know, I could be wrong, and honestly, I invite any of you to debate me on this theory. But if you like my theory, well, please tell me that too. Believe it or not, some days I could really use the encouragement. Until next time, this is Ed, signing off. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, recorded, and voiced by me, Ed Barnhart. If you like what you heard, please like, share, comment, and do all that other stuff I'm supposed to ask you to do. And if you really liked it, consider supporting Archeo Ed through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for Archeo Ed. I'm in there somewhere. I make these podcasts for free, but I'm not opposed to making money. In fact, if you folks could free me from my day job, well, I'd be much obliged. Archeoed is my intellectual property. All rights reserved. Copyright 2024.